Thank you. Thank you to the Community Foundation for hosting me. Uh, and uh, thank you all for being here. So you know a little bit about me. What I, well, not quite yet. Here we go. Here's a little bit about me. I'm a former nonprofit executive director, uh, program manager. I started my career in nonprofits off as a welfare rights organizer, and then a tenant organizer, and then a low-income community organizer, and I moved on to economic development. Um, I have a deep passion for movement building and change. That is from the ground up. I um, received my MBA from Bar Ilan University in Israel in 2008, and then I created my own firm, Community Organizer 2.0. It's a digital engagement strategy firm. And since March, I have been working with the National Brain Tumor Society as their director of outreach as well. Now you know a little bit about me, and that's probably all I really feel like saying, uh, because you may have read it. But I'd like to know a little bit about you. So if you're, I'd like you to stand up if your position at your organization or your volunteer position at the organization is focused around communications externally. Stand up. Let's see. All right. Please sit down. I just want to do that, like the rabbis and the ministers do it, you know? Um, so if your position is focused on fundraising primarily and development, please stand up. A lot of the same faces, huh? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. If you are an executive director of your organization, slash CEO, slash only person there, yeah, <laughs> stand up. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. And if you are a program person, that's what you do. You develop programs and make them awesome and successful, stand up. All right, thank you very much. Who did I miss? What do you do? I'm the secretary of an organization, but do other things. Secretary, but does other things too. I, I assume related to fundraising and storytelling. Yes, because you asked me the question when we started. Who else did I miss? Anyone? All right. Thank you all. Ideally, this uh, today is going to address all of your what you do in your daily life and help you to translate that into telling stories that are powerful, that move people to action. So this is a little bit about what we'll talk about today, why stories resonate, we're gonna, there's something I call small moment stories. So one of the things that I do is digital engagement and social media, and we can tell stories constantly through social media. It doesn't have to be a video that's 2.5 minutes. Instead, we can tell a story, and I'll give you a few examples of how to do that, that can support your video, can support your larger storytelling strategy, or can support smaller asks and smaller stories. Then we're going to talk about uh, finding your organizational stories or your program or your project stories, whatever it is that you want to tell to support Valley Gives Day. Um, elements of a great story and developing your story. We have kind of a brisk agenda today. We started a little late. I may go five minutes late. And if you have to leave, you have to leave. And I will not be offended by that. So all day long we tell stories. That's what we do. Just think about the last time you were telling a story to somebody. Was it last night at dinner? This morning to your partner? Were you calling your sister and telling her about what happened to you this weekend? This is what we do. This is how we connect with others, is that we tell stories. So Scientific American did this study about two years ago that said personal stories and gossip make up 65% of our daily conversations. And if we just reflect on that for a second, I think you'll find that it's, it's true. You, you, you kind of relate what happens in your life through an anecdote or a story about something. Or you hear that story on public radio that you want to share. When we're told a story, we also tend to experience the story empathetically. So if there's something that really moves you, maybe you found yourself sitting in the driveway, not able to leave your car because you're listening to that story, and at the same time, you're just so moved Maybe you're emotionally taken with that story. Or somebody tells you something at a conference, and, and it's something that has just happened to them, and you're so ecstatic for them, and you're emotionally moved. So this is how we connect in our brain centers. The story connects with the heart. When we hear a story, <clears throat> we try and relate it to something we already know. Haven't you had that experience talking to somebody where you say, oh, this has happened to me, and they say, oh, yeah, yeah. Just like when that happened to me about 20 years ago. I remember that, right? Or 
you know, a tragedy has happened and you are relaying what has happened and someone says, I totally get that. That happened to me and my family too. So we relate to it. So if we can kind of take those elements, right? We tell stories naturally. It's what we do. We relate to them as we hear them. And then because we want to forge a connection, we relate back. We say, oh yeah, I remember I felt that way when I experienced that. My friend also told me about that. Right? That's how we connect as humans. Now, we have two ways that we experience stories. There's decoding, what's actually happening in the story. That's kind of up here. And then what, what we're experiencing when we're hearing the story. Stories that don't move you sit here. You just spend the time decoding it. Oh, that was sort of an interesting story I heard. But they don't move you here. Some stories move you here, but they're so emotional, you actually can't process them up here. The best stories combine both. So and it, when we decode a story, we think about what's, what are the numbers, what are the stats. When we hear the stats on homelessness, for example, that's just a stat that's giving us a piece of information about the story. Now, I didn't see your video about homeless in a college town. Is that what it was called? Yep. All right. But I'm imagining, because you're a videographer, that it also went here. So we got the stats. And then we, we felt, we started to experience what that stat meant for us. And that's the best story that we can possibly have. So, oops, did I go the wrong direction? No, I think I just said a duplicate slide. OK. So this is a study, Wagner Edstrom created a study called uh, Digital Persuasion. And it, it's a wonderful report. This is the link here. And it goes on about why we share stories, why we tell stories, why people are engaged in social media, what social media moves them to do. I highly recommend downloading it. It's from 2013. And one question they asked folks were, which of the following reasons best describes why you chose to take further action beyond just supporting the charity or course on social media? And storytelling's way up there. I read a story on social media that made me want to do more. I watched an online video that made me want to do more. I saw a photo on social media that made me want to do more. I was at the annual meeting, I guess it was not this year, but in 2013, of Jewish Family and Children's Services. And they showed this video that is this award-winning video they made called Izzy's Story. And he's a Holocaust survivor and what he does to help other Holocaust survivors. And there was not a dry eye in that room at all. I mean, first of all, you're at a Jewish event and you're talking about the Holocaust. But second of all, his story was so moving. And it was, it was uh, even I, I just empathetically totally related to wanting to connect with others, which is what he wanted to do, right? And I, I swear, everybody at the table like pulled the envelope out and just threw some money in. They were like, yep, we're giving to Izzy. It, it moved you to take further action. So that's just my brief overview of, of stories. And before I move on, I wondered if somebody wanted or, or could think of a story that moved them to take further action. Anybody here thinking, have one in mind? Yes. Did you raise your hand? Or did you just <coughs> pull some hair away? <laughs> And what was it? Did you did you hear it? Did you see it by video? Did well? I, did you read it? I knew it about it going on, but I think what what's really generated for everybody else was um, it was uh, there was a story written um, put on a, a crowdsourcing and then shared via mm -hmm. Facebook. Mm -hmm. So that's how it got mm -hmm. spread. And, and then from there. You know, radio interviews and television and stuff. But it, that's how yeah. it started, was written. And you bring a really good point up. So somebody that you know on Facebook that you're connected with shared it with you, right? right. And did that give make you want to look it. at it because of that, right? Be that. Was it because of the story or the story and the fact that you knew the person that shared it? Um, I would say... The first thing was that I knew this person personally. Okay. Um, but it was such a big story that yeah. even if I didn't, you would do it. Yeah. Well, I I know a lot of people that yeah. didn't and, and then went to share that. Sure. 
So the story was powerful and it moved you yeah. and the person who asked, who posted it is somebody that you knew. Right. Yeah. Anybody else have a story that they, that still sticks with them? Yes. Well, mine is kind of, well, it's very personal, but it's also very much public. My assistant was murdered by her ex-husband 12 years ago and yesterday was the Domestic Violence Task Force Walk Against Violence. Wow. And back when it happened, there was no Facebook, there was no right. any of that, but now we're doing a Dancing with the Stars fundraiser. The information has gone out so much more, but I think we need to do more about it in terms of <coughs> getting more people involved. Mm -hmm. You actually bring up a really good point. So this is a time right now in history where domestic violence is really at the top of our minds, given everything that has been happening, right, in the media. Um, and it's linked with the, what's happening to women on campuses. And there's a lot of awareness of violence against women that's happening. So this is a very good time, actually, to create a story that links, because it's present in our minds right now that folks can relate to. They're like, oh, I read that in the media. Oh, here's a story in my community I can relate to, right? So we have these small moment stories. There's this quote by Maya Angelou I just love. I'm not gonna read it. You guys can read it on your own. But it's about how you feel when you hear a story. And it's how it makes you feel. Happy, sad, confused. Confused is not what you want. Um, motivated, concerned, uh, deeply moved. So I came across this about two years ago, uh, kind of in the early stages of Pinterest. This is what I saw. I saw a post. Somebody said, you've got to check this out, by Ami Musa. Um, says, this is what 13-year-olds uh, like Ami from Sierra Leone really want, repin to remind people of what the world's poorest children dream of. This is so simple. It's so simple. But put together with the pin board that Ami Musa created, it's pretty powerful. So here's Ami. If you go to her profile, it says she lives in Sierra Leone, and it says that she's actually been created by this organization, UNICEF UK. And it says this is what she really wants. You know, she wants water you know, that she can access. She wants clean water. She wants sanitation, soap. She wants an education. And together, it's super simple, but it tells this story. And it has a relatable, fictional, albeit, character, right? And I think that, well, the reason I show you this is to explain that a story doesn't need to be an award-winning one-minute, 30-second video. You, this can be your story. And I've seen some powerful giving pages that have stories like this on it. Um, and easy enough to upload, um, whether it's fictional or real, dramatized might be the better way to put this your story up on your Valley Gives page like this. And then you can support it through social media. So here's a, pin a way in Pinterest that folks are supporting stories. And I just said it can be that simple. Um, Charity Water does a great job of telling stories. Does anybody follow Charity Water? No? OK, a few people. So they dig wells in Africa. Um, I think that if you're going to look to an organization that has uh, fully integrated storytelling into its DNA, it is Charity Water. And I always look to them to see what they're doing because they, they have just totally owned it. So this is a Facebook post. And again, it's just a little story. It's a quote from this woman. In the past, we didn't have time to do more jobs. Because of the tap, we can make pots, dress hair, sell things like mangoes. We have time to do all of it. Having a borehole has changed our lives. It's super simple. It's it's, it takes the story, puts it with the ask. I don't know that this story is going to compel anyone to give, but it does when you see story after story after story like this, and they're all about people. Now, I work at the National Brain Tumor Society, and I can tell you that when we post on our Facebook page quotes or features of people who are either living with a brain tumor or caring for someone with a brain tumor, that gets more shares, more comments, more opinions than anything else we post because it's a relatable character. We're empathetic and we're sympathetic at the same time, which I'll talk about in a minute. This is the Next Up Foundation. I think they're out of California. Uh, this Instagram. Who's on Instagram here? Instagram. Great visual media. Instagram, I'm showing visual media here. Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram. So they, they actually do skateboarding 
for kids that don't have access to skateboarding. It's, it's, a, it's a youth empowerment program. And this guy, you know, wrote, well, Next Up Foundation wrote, Elkin came into our program in Santa Ana today for the first time, not knowing much about skateboarding. After 45 minutes of practice, there he is. Simple story. Now look at these posts. It's awesome. Does he have a grizzly grip? Wish there was a program like you in Jersey. If you go to any of their posts, you know, tons of posts from kids, youth, teens, who um, love hearing these stories. So they're getting right at their audience. They're, they're bringing people in exactly who they want to bring into this. Here's Juan. He's a participant in the Next Up Foundation. And he's like, today I had a crazy awesome day in the Next Up Foundation because I faced my fear of the two blocks, anger and bullying, because my awesome teacher, Vina and Benny, helped me how to fight the fear and don't get scared. Thank you, Vina and Benny. I heart Next Up Foundation. No one can tell this story better than Juan. No one can. So that's the second thing that I want to share, is that no one can tell your story better than you. And no one can tell your story better than the folks who are experiencing it, right? And, and that's something I think that, um, that we don't remember when we create fundraising campaigns and when we create program materials, uh, that we, do, we want to share everyone else's story. But when we think about who can share it best, it's our program participants. And it's the folks that benefit from our programs. And if we can pull up and surface their stories, that will do everyone a service. So here's another example of a fictionalized character, Lily the Black Bear. Lily the Black Bear is an awesome Facebook page. <laughs> and this is for the um, Northeast Bear Center. No, no, new, is it Northeast? North American. North American Bear Center, yes, NABC, that's it. Um, so Lily's a bear, and one of the things they did was they, they thought, I'm sure, they thought, how, how do we make people feel for bears? And they, and they have a bear in their animal center in the forest named Lily. For the longest time, they have a webcam in the cave, or in the den, excuse me. For the longest time, they would show webcams of Lily and Lily playing with her children and what should we name Lily and what should we feed Lily. Lily's not feeling well. You've got your basic info here of, you know, it's associated with the North American Bear Center in Eli, Minnesota. This is what they do. But really, when you go to the post, it's all about, you know, it's the webcam. And people are saying, I hope Lily's feeling better, or I hope, you know, Lily's grandchildren are feeling better. And they have made a relatable character with a long-term story arc. And that's another way that you can go. You can take a program participant. You can take a program. You can take a volunteer, a board member, and do a long-term story arc. No reason not to. And continue to support that through social media. They also, I will, I will say, they have something called a lily pad picnic. So all their rabidly engaged fans, incredibly enthusiastic fans, like, like you just got to go to the page and see that they have like 568 likes on every post. Um, they invite them to meet up in Eli, Minnesota every year for a lily pad picnic. And people show. They pay their own money and they show up. So like, that's the next step of what happens when you engage people in a story. And then lastly, this is, um, uh, so this is called Star Day. It's um, part of an organization called Epic Change. They created a, a, a Star Day. Uh, it was this past June where they invited folks to gaze upon the stars outside because Gideon Gidori from Tanzania wants to be the first African astronaut. And he, cre he actually got uh, accepted into an astronaut focused high school, I can't remember what it is, in Florida. And they then raised money for his tuition. And he gives these wonderful video updates. It's, I think, at rally.org and also at Kickstarter. Um, he gives these wonderful updates about what, what he's learning and what it's like. And here's just another long-term story that you can follow. And for his fundraising page, it just started with a photo and his story. So what do these stories have in common, right? They have people in common. So remember when we talked about the data versus the decoding versus the experiencing? All of these stories are experiencing. And you can th add the decoding to give it heft and weight. But the experiencing is what matters here. These are, these are photos all taken from the uh, Facebook page Humans of New York. You recognize it? Yeah. Actually, that's, that's Jerusalem, interestingly. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, it was. But uh, so he's not in New York right now. He's in Jerusalem. But um, that's a fabulous Facebook page, Humans of New York. A story every single day, one or two at least. So I think as a, a nonprofit person, it's really hard to find these stories. Or if we have the stories, you know, person over here doesn't know about the story, and person over here needs to know about the story. But person over there has the story. So what I'd like to do <clears throat> is to ask you to turn to the person next to you. And um, we'll take 10 minutes for this. And ask, for the first five minutes, what environment contributes towards staff finding and unearthing your organization story? So what, what is already in place that you can leverage to find stories within your organization? Write them down. This is for you, right? And then I'll tell you to move to the next question, which is, what obstructs or prevents you? <laughs> There's a laughter here. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> from finding stories in your organization. And I can tell you now that I can think of a lot more things here in general than here in any organization I've ever worked at. And that's OK, because all this is is an opportunity to become this, right? So uh, it's 9.40, more or less, 9.36 actually on my clock. So we'll take five minutes and start on the green question. And then I'll tell you to switch and think together on the red question. Thank you. Yvonne. I would love to hear if anybody wants to share anything that they that is their story. Please don't share someone else's story about what environment contributes towards staff finding and unearthing <coughs> your organization's stories. I'd love to hear a couple. Yes, over here. Um, in, in my, I, I'm going to say I'm in the Culture Center in, in Springfield, and um, I, I found that I found that Valley Gives is actually giving my reason. Trying to tell a very uh, rich story of the history of DRCC since 1978. Obviously, I wasn't around right. since then, so we're trying to pull all that stuff together to really say this is who we are, where we came from, where we are, where we're going. That's great. Like that. So, Valley Gibbs yeah. has given you that opportunity. What else did anybody else come up with? Yes, and if you could say the name of your organization. Um, CSF of uh, Westfield Dollars for Scholars. Uh, we're a scholarship organization that's been around for a long time. And we actually have a lot of stories. We have a lot of uh, the kids write thank you letters for us, and some of them have wonderful stories in them. Mm -hmm. And we have our donors who have put up endowments for scholarships who again have these wonderful stories, sometimes very moving people who died in horrible accidents and you know the family wanted to, to give back through educational scholarships. But the big thing is we don't we have them, but we don't know how to share them. I mean, we share okay. them in our awards program. Uh, we have a website that hardly anybody ever goes to that we have the stories on. Yeah. We have a Facebook page that nobody goes to. So our thing is, how, how do we, we're not getting them out there. I think there's an opportunity for small moment stories for you to just consistently share them and people will start, begin to engage, ideally. But it's a much longer conversation. I'm not going to say that it's that easy. Right. So thinking about the question of what's the environment, like what are the environmental factors that contribute towards creating a culture of storytelling? Does anybody have a thought on that? Yes. Time. Time. <laughs> Keep going. Well, time and also having, being able to be amongst the people where you, who have the stories. Access. Time yeah. and access. Time and access. OK. How about this side of the room? Anybody on this side of the room have an idea, uh, have, uh, would like to contribute something towards the green side of this? Yes. Making the effort to pick up the phone and say, "Oh, can we go to lunch? Can I take you to lunch?" And I'd love to, you know, hear more about you. <coughs> Where I work, I work for Franklin County Home Care Corporation that serves elders and people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. and a lot of our staff are very, very busy case managers with tons of clients, but some of the amazing stories they just love their clients. But yeah, they get, you know, really need to make a big effort to get time mm -hmm. with them. Hear the stories. They don't really have a staff room. Or right. People are busy. So. Thank you. So time, access, and interest. Yes. Yeah, think to ask. Think to ask. That's great. I'm going to move over to the red side. What instructs or prevents your staff from finding stories? I work at a day school. We have tons of stories. My biggest problem is training the teachers to take photos and send me information about the stories that I'm not aware about that are happening. Okay. I like making them live it. Exactly. 
Yes. You also need to edit the stories and shape the stories. Um, I worked with um, youth up through 72-year-old folks, and they do write stories, but they need to be shaped in a way that's really going to jump out. Um, so is that is that an obstruction because they need to be it shaped? Takes time. It takes time. Yeah. Okay, so time is the plus and the minus here. Yes, over okay, back here. Our green side and red side are sometimes the same. That we have the stories, but finding a way to share them in a way that isn't exploiting the person who has the story. The staff has the stories, but getting them to share them so that we can share them is, I work at Girls in Capolio. Yeah. So the girls are there every day sharing yeah. their stories, but, but having the staff say, okay, here's what you can say. Right. Is this I, saw, I saw yours, but I think I saw yours over here. Yeah. yeah. To, just to add on that. We were talking about that over there, that with the privacy issues, that's when the fictionalized character may come into to being here. We've in the past used stock photos of the kids, but it doesn't have the same emotional It's very obvious. All right, I'm going to do two more. I saw a hand there, and I think I saw your hand after that. Yes. I work for Tapestry Health out of the Fire Regional Office in Texas, and we, uh, we have needle exchanges, we have reproductive health care, uh, we have a variety of programs, and uh, I know that we do great work, and I know that we save lives and save lives, but the work that we do, people don't want to share that publicly. People don't want to talk about their heroin use. That's a big obstacle, people don't want to talk about the heroin use. Right. Huge. Huge obstacle. That's really interesting. I'm going to think about that one. Thank you. Yes. I'm going to round it down about the Springfield, and we have a lot. I mean, we have a lot of stories, and we we get access to them. But I think the ending, when someone mentioned that, is like rounding it up to see what the, the end result is. We we see babies all the time. They come in and they're ready to go home, but there's we we're having problems getting the ending of the story. How the updates from the families, how things are going. Sometimes it, we just don't have the touch yeah. after that. Maybe your story is the middle. The middle is your story. Just a thought. Uh, so this is a great exercise if you felt that you could take it back to your office to do in a staff meeting or in, as, a, as an exercise within your office. Um, I've done that in our office. I've also done it with organizations that I've consulted with. And it's, you know, just like the folks in your, that you serve or that volunteer or participate in your programs know the stories the best you know best why, what your issues are in finding, sourcing, and cultivating stories. So I'm going to move on because really what we're here to do is figure out what our story is for Valley Gibbs, right? So here's some elements of a strong story. I am going to play this, whoops, this video, if I can get to it. Now, hold on, I have to go to escape and then go, oh, please tell me it's going to come back. <coughs> All right, ready? I'd like you to meet my daughter, Jordan. Jordan is 15 years old, and like many teenage girls, she loves her iPad. She loves fashion, and she way loves the color purple. But Jordan isn't a typical teenager. She's also a cancer slayer. Ten years ago, she was diagnosed with a rare form of brain cancer. She has a diffuse tumor that covers all of her brain and all of her spine. She's spent more than half her life in treatment, and she's endured chemotherapy, radiation, and more surgeries than we care to remember. Childhood cancer is a tenacious beast, but it pales in comparison to the awesome strength of my daughter. Jordan amazes us every day. She never gives up, and she never lets cancer get her down. We coined the nickname Cancer Slayer when after a brief period of remission, her doctors discovered a new tumor growing in her spine. And the scariest part was the fact that she needed a risky surgical procedure, one that we were told could cause her to be paralyzed from the waist down. Jordan is continuing her fight against cancer every single day. Sometimes she experiences these debilitating seizures that cause my beautiful spirited daughter to transform into a zombie she leaves me but when she comes back when she comes back I know we're in this fight together my daughter is a fighter she doesn't look back she doesn't wallow in the misfortunes the disease has sometimes hurled at her 
And instead, she spends every day thinking about what she can do next. Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation is one of our favorite causes because it attracts a community of slayers like Jordan and like her hero, Alexandra Scott. It's founded on a belief that we can find a cure for all children with cancer. There are so many children who wake up every day determined to kick cancer's butt, but the truth is they thrive when they know they have supporters like you. Together, we can slay childhood cancer. Thank you. All right. Well, that, that just gets me every time. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Let me go back to my less emotional PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> um, okay, so I didn't show that actually because I have, I work at the National Brain Tumor Society. I showed that because it was the palm d'or winner, so to speak, of the YouTube Do-Gooder Awards. So if you go to youtube.com forward slash do-gooder, I believe it is, uh, well, there. There's the link right there. Nonprofit Video Awards. You will see a lot of awesome videos. T go there. Get ideas from that. And this was the overall grand prize winner. And, and it's, it's pretty powerful. So before I kind of walk through why this has all the elements of a strong story, I'd love to hear from you. What, what, what makes this a good story? Hand in the back. It was a narrow voice. A narrow voice? What do you mean? Their own voice. Thank you. Somebody talking yeah. about this story. It was his story his and story. his family's story. Was there a hand over here? I thought. Hand here. Of uh, the choice of words, carefully crafted, like cancer slayer. Yeah, that's a good uh, one. What she can do best. All the <coughs> phrases. Something really thought about what words to use. I think Alex's lemonade stand helped them craft that story, and it's a very strongly worded story. Yes, over here. His voice was very relatable and conversational. It didn't sound like he was very formal. You could mm -hmm. imagine just like he was having a conversation with you, conversation. telling you the story you know, face a, to face. It's a great insight. I saw you and then you. Yes. Um, it was also uh, hopeful and inspiring rather than focusing on the bad part. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's interesting that the video itself had no video in it. It mm -hmm. was very. That's uh, another reason I chose it. Very impactful uh, <laughs> and professionally done photographs that I think yeah. spoke more eloquently than a video could. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 woman in the blue. Did you have your hand up? No, you had. Someone over here. <coughs> yes. I just think it deals really honestly with the with what cancer does. Honestly, to the human body. I mean, you see her in, in, in a place of weakness. You see her in a place of strength, and shows how debilitating it can be, but also that she can overcome that. Yes. The tempo was really masterful because it's so overwhelming. You're beginning to think of the cause of cancer, and they show you the stitches, and then the images at the end with the lemonade stand. Yeah. And her so speaking. You go from feeling horrible to like, you know, oh, I can relate to a child to lemonade stand. It's like it's not like mm -hmm. a monstrous story that actually pushes away the roof of office, brings it really into a domestic kind of. Yeah, more manageable. Yeah. Any anyone have a final comment before I move on? I thought that the the ending where it's together we can. Yeah. And um, the idea, oftentimes we say you can help us. Better together. Right. It's right. Together, and and it was tied back to the cancer slayer. So, in the video itself, it was the the girl is the cancer slayer, uh -huh. and now it's you you can be the cancer slayer. So uh, you've already had your webinar uh, with Mark Pittman, right, mm -hmm. fundraising coach? He has this phrase called the phrase that pays in fundraising. He says, always look for the phrase that pays. Um, can anybody think of what the phrase that pays might be from here? Yes. To me, it was when he said, um, and she leaves me, and then he pauses. Okay. I know. <laughs> A beautiful girl. Right. Yes. Yes? The cancer slayer. Uh -huh. Anyone else? Phrase that pays. It's the one that basically you can market and it will you will get returns from it. Cancer slayer, I'm hearing. All right. So let's let's talk about this story for a second. So any strong story, like elements of storytelling, whether you see a Ken Burns video, a documentary, excuse me, or whether you're going to read a story that was in the local paper, has this. It simplifies a complex idea to its essence. 
boy, brain tumors, really complex. He could have gone into the science of it and how it spread and all that, but he didn't. The, the complex idea here was that you can beat it with your spirit. There's a story arc. There's adversity. There are allies. Ideally, you overcome adversity. In this case, she, you know, she, we don't know if she's overcome it, but she's overcoming it through her spirit. Her allies are, uh, you know, implied that it's Alex's lemonade stand. And the story arc creates a connection with the audience. It has a relatable main character. We can, we can say that Jordan is a relatable main character here. It involves sympathy and empathy. The character has a problem. You sympathize. Poor kid. This is awful what you have. And the character is seeking a solution. You empathize with her father and what he is going through and how desperately he wants a solution, but how proud he is of his daughter. There's a stake involved for the main character. A stake means there's something to lose if it doesn't succeed. There's, I don't even have to tell you what the stake is here. We know. And it gives the audience one strong message that ideally, in our case, I added, inspires action. So what would the strong message be here? Is there a strong message? It's emotional, but what's the strong message? Yes? You're all part of this, too. We're better together. You could be part mm -hmm. of this, too. You could be part of this, too. Yes? Together, we can change this. Yeah. We can beat this. Yes. We I, can cure this. I agree. I think that is the strong message. So a story without stakes, I'm just going to like put a little point on this. Yeah. Yes? Just to put this aside, um, I work for an organization. So I just wanted to point that because this is all wonderful. And, but well, what's a world without know. music? Yeah. Yes, but there, yeah. anyway, that, there, the world will have music even without playing about the music. I mean, that's, that's you know, yes. well, you see what I'm saying. I, well, listen to what the next piece and then see if it gets you thinking. How about that? I'll, we'll be open. I'm, and I'm willing to have this conversation again. So I, a story without stakes is really just an essay, right? Like, what do you stand to gain or lose? That's what the stakes are about. What happens if, if there's nothing gained, right? Um, let's see. So a story without stakes is really just an idea. Here's the idea, fight back against cancer. That's an idea. Or here's an idea, the, um, brain tumors kill. But here's the story, meet Alex, learn, sorry, not, I don't know why I wrote Alex, meet Jordan. Learn who she is, learn what's happened to her, what's in the way, how she fights back, will she succeed? I think we're left wondering. <coughs> there, she, she's got skin in the game, literally, and she has stakes. So we think about it, does it have a relatable character, story arc, problem, solution, stakes, and then that phrase that pays. Now I'm going to show this. And I understand that this, I found this video. Has everybody seen it? <laughs> it's a great video. Um, but I do understand that the campaign itself was somewhat controversial in the community. I just want to say that I found this for the video and not for whether or not the campaign is controversial. Um, so I want to show it to you.
So, they were not successful, unfortunately. I feel a little sad about that. This is different. If we, this is, this is a video about how, how did it make you feel? It doesn't have one relatable character. The character is, who's the character? The library. The town and the library. The stake is, what's the stake? <coughs> they don't raise the money. They're stuck in this really small space, right? How did it make you feel? Part of the community, what did I hear? Kind of happy. Kind of happy. Somebody said something over here. Joyful and excited. Joyful and excited. Do you feel like they really got across? Let's see, was there sympathy? Yes. Yeah. What about empathy? Yeah. I think you really felt how small that space was, didn't yeah. you, in the melting shoes? Yeah. That's what I related to. I was like, oh, that's bad. Right? Um, so here's the phrase that pays in this one, right? That's the phrase that pays. So you're, I wanted to show this as an alternative. It, you don't always have to focus on one person, but the story can be an inanimate or a, a combined, connected community. The community can be the main character in this, right? So let's think about right now in your organization, and I'm going to guarantee you that there are four types of stories you have right now. You have a founder story or a founding story. The story of, it's your creation story. It's your beret sheet. How did this happen? You have your people stories. Who are your people? In fact, all of you told me you've got people stories. It's a question of editing them or getting them or taking the time to find them. Uh, there's the what you do stories. I think that's the story we fall back on. We always talk about what we do. And that's the decoding. We have to figure out how to move the what we do story to here right, the heart, and then impact stories. We often tell those, you'll find them in every annual report. There's some impact story, right? It's a question of how do you make that into a story rather than just a fact or an idea, right? So you have four stories. What I'd like you to do is turn to your, your share pair partner, the one you worked with before, please, and um, think about one story you have right now that you can leverage for Valley Gives. And talk through what's your, what's your complex idea simplified? What's your one line idea? What's, who's the relatable main character? Is there any stake? I think that's about all you'll have time to get to. Um, and then you can build out the rest afterwards. But as much as you can get to it, this would be great. We're going to take 10 minutes again. Um, and I'm going to tell you when five minutes has gone by. Go. So I recognize that. Five minutes each is not enough to develop your killer story. <laughs> but I hope that it is a start. As I walked around, a couple of people asked me questions, and I'm going to share them. One is, where do you start? I usually start with what the stake is involved. And once I can figure the stake out, then the story can follow. I can find a main character. I can find some sympathy, some empathy, etc. cetera. Uh, our storytelling uh, gurus over there in the corner. I'm curious, where do you start when developing a story? Um, I really think having a relatable main character is extremely important um, because that's, that's his or her story. And you need to have that person be very, very relatable. I think for me that's absolutely key. If you don't have the person that is the, I call them the protagonist, mm -hmm. you're, you're not going to be able to really develop a story. It could be an animal too. Yes, Lily. Right. I don't. I haven't done animals yet. <laughs> please, please answer that. The transformation. The transformation. All right. So we have relatable main character. What is the transformation that happens in the story? I tend to start with the stake. I guess this proves there's no one place to start. But those are three good parts of a triangle that you could start from, and they get you to the other pieces. Uh, another question I got was, how long should a video be? No more than a minute 30 seconds. That's my answer. Do you guys have a different answer back there? I mean, it can, you can stretch it to two minutes if it's super engaging like the Alex's Lemonade Stand video. But I can tell you from looking at our our, our YouTube statistics and YouTube statistics of every video I've ever worked with, viewership drops way off after two minutes. Like, 
like 60% will go by then. So the one good thing, it's like, it's like tweeting in 140 characters. It makes you have a very tight story. Tracy. Um, if you feel like your story is longer, you can do what Deborah said in the beginning, which is like do, do separate installments, mm -hmm. so to speak. Story arc. Yeah. Right. So you can create a minute, and it'll make them want another minute, yeah. and another minute, but it's their choice to go watch those other minutes, right. or you can post them, wait a day or two, post another one. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gideon Ghidori, the, the Tanzanian astronaut wannabe, he has these one-minute updates that are just, you just want the next one. It's like, it's like Kid President. You just want to know what he's going to say next. Um, if you haven't seen Kid President, some of you have. I would highly recommend seeing Kid President. All right, the, the third story I got was, well, what, how do I f figure out what the stake is? Um, and I always go back to the question of what happens if your organization doesn't exist? Like who is affected? What happens to those people? How is their life made become, how does it, how does it change? So kind of those are kind of reflection questions to think about. And then you can also think about it if you start with a main character. What happens with that protagonist if your organization isn't around? So those are sort of some some starting points. Does anybody feel like, and well, I'm sorry, I am actually going to move on so we can get to all the content. And if we have questions, I'll, I'll, at the end, I'll take some questions. I was going to ask you to share some of your stories, but I think it's probably more valuable for me to just finish up the content. Anyway, thank you for that piece. So here's just some really quick tips about creating strong visuals. So you may decide to tell a story that is a combination of visuals that are not a video whatsoever, but perhaps they're um, a map or some data, infographics, or you know, f just photos. And um, I wanted to leave you with a couple of con visual content tips. So don't assume that everyone's going to react the same way to your visual. That's a really important assumption to check. I know it from personal experience. There is an organization that I worked with, um, and they unveiled a new logo. We've all heard this story of the organization that works on the logo that flops. And it turns out that the logo's colors were extremely <laughs> offensive to a segment of its population for reasons I cannot go into. Um, they just didn't check their assumptions with other folks. So always check, test your visuals. Um, people look at pages differently and they look at visuals differently. Pair photos with words for impact. So uh, if you can find genuine images, if your organization and the population you work with allows that. Use real people that you know, with their permission, of course, um, for impact. And there's like a KISS metric study that talked about how images plus text actually have much stronger impact than just images or just text. So think about that as well. Invest the most in the first image you show. We all know for, uh, the, what they say about first impressions, the first 20 seconds you meet somebody, the first video, the first frame of your video, the first image that you show. Think carefully about what that will be. Um, also, when you're creating a video, you can choose the still that it stops on to sh with the like play sign in the middle, remember? So think carefully about what that still is as well. Uh, people relate to people, so people-centric photos. My huge pet peeve is when I go on a Facebook page of an organization and it shows the building. <laughs> I mean, buildings will stay long after that organization has left the place, right? But people, people is what the organization is about. So right now, if you have a building, go change that. <laughs> Think about the emotion you want the visual to convey. So I talked about how do, how do each of those videos make you feel, how do photos make you feel? That everybody can relate to that, how that makes you feel. Then there are all kinds of ways. I mean, I do a whole hour and a half session on just this, the different ways that you can tell stories. Um, but if we look at it, I've kind of put them into categories. There's static photo storytelling, right? We, I showed you some examples of Instagram and Pinterest to, sh to share those small moment stories. Tumblr is a very visual blog. You can blog. I love reading the Fresh Air blog on Tumblr. Fresh Air is an NPR. Um, 
uh, interview format show. And here it is, it's a radio show, but they have a visual Tumblr blog, and it just gets my mind spinning in different ways to think about how do they make something on radio so visual? Uh, it's a beautiful challenge they've created for themselves. Um, JPEGs or GIFs or whatever you are, just the way that you save the image. There's this one called Tag Galaxy that I think is fun, but nobody ever uses. And it, you know, it can pull images based on tags from the internet, which is kind of fun. Um, data visualization storytelling. So that's what we're all talking about, our data viz. Infographics, infographics that are not text, but actually they're showing a piece of information that you can grasp in about three seconds, and it distills that information into a graphic, right? Maps are wonderful data visualization. Uh, Charity Water has some great example of maps and where they drill their wells. You can talk, impact stories are great, uh, great if you tell them with maps. Um, Dipity is also kind of a map type tool. Uh, it's a timeline, actually it's a timeline. So you can tell the story of your organization along a timeline using Dipity. Visually, are, um, you can go and find infographics there or create infographics there. Mind maps. Simple, simple, you can even write it on a piece of paper like we used to do mind maps when we were in high school or there are all kinds of tools out there to create a mind map. And ThingLink is really fun. It's a map of, you, you can take a picture and then you, you, you put little points on the picture with pop-up pieces of information. Depends on how like into this stuff you want to get. You can go simple, you can go complex. You, video, right, we all know about YouTube. Animoto is a great, um, a uh, tool for taking photos and making them into videos, just like we saw with um, the Alex's Lemonade stand. Vimeo is another photo sharing, so, uh, video sharing site, and Vine, I just use that as an example of just short form video, seven second video, 15 second videos on Instagram, short form video is where things are going, and you can post those every single day. In fact, I just saw Oh, I know what it is. I subscribed to Social Media Examiner, and he just had a podcast, an hour-long podcast on leveraging Vine videos. So that might be a resource to think about. And then um, Storify. This is all um, Storify, Scoopid, Contribune, Paperly, Twitter. These are all about curating your stories. So you can actually create curated um, places that people go to get information that are only stories about your organization. So Storify, you would bring in tweets and videos and links and photos that people have shared all using the same hashtag. So if you have a conference and they use a hashtag, you can pull it all in or scoop it is the same thing. You can, you can go explore these yourself. But these are different ways to share your stories, um, not just through a video. So, reminder to share it everywhere, right? You've created a video, so what? Now let's share it on social media, on your website, through email. If you're gonna share a video through email with an ask, by the way, my solemn advice is that you share a still from the video. And when people click to it, they go to the landing donation page. Because if they watch the video in the email, they won't also donate. So that's just a piece of advice. Um, a microsite meaning a special a page on your website or a special website that you create that's just about your story or about the campaign. Your fundraising page, obviously, share it there. Newsletters, e-newsletters, um, real life newsletters, annual reports, you can share them everywhere. There are video annual reports that are fabulous. There's a wonderful one from the, what's it called? The New Museum, I think it is, out of, out of Canada, which I love. Um, final checklist of your stories. Say the story out loud. I think that's a great way to know whether your story resonates. Share it with somebody, and you'll, as you're saying it out loud, you'll hear yourself what parts catch and what parts don't catch. Um, aim for the heart. Test your images. Test your stories. You may have to come up with three or four different stories and figure out which one is the best. Make it personal. Include sympathetic and empathetic elements. Um, I like that I'm going to add include the transformation. I like that. Uh, it should have a beginning, middle, and end if it's really a story. Create a sense of urgency. So there's got to be a stake involved, right? Um, make sure that there's one awesome visual early on in your story. We are, a <laughs> we are now a nation that has lost all interest in anything after a minute. So just make sure it's early on. Uh, talk about the money. 
Don't hide from the money if what you're doing is fundraising. It's important, right? Shootsbury Library, they have their signs up with the money. Um, why do you need it? What's the gap? How much is needed? What, what will it do for your organization? What will it enable you to do? Um, make it seem attainable, right? So if really what you need is $300 million and you're an organization with a 5,000 person mailing list and an annual budget of 100,000, that's not going to seem attainable. <laughs> so think about what could be attainable, right? I, because you, you really want people to feel that they're part of your story and they can be part of your story and making it seem attainable is a piece of that. And then invite donors to be part of the solution, that better together that you mentioned. We can do this together. Um, is important. Here are some 2013 Valley Give stories, which I enjoyed. Um, and this will be part of the slideshow. You can go and you can visit them. I think one of them, maybe it's the Gendara Mental Health. One of them is more just photos. Um, the others are video stories. OK, don't forget to have fun. <laughs> this isn't a drudgery. This should be something awesome. Uh, you have your guides there in the corner. You want to stand up and wave, both of you, Janice and Ruth, right? Those are your storytelling guides. They're your Sherpas um, who will work with you. If you have any questions, I always say whenever I give a presentation that follow-up questions are part of this presentation. Feel free to send them to me, tweet to me, connect with me, however you want. I am, I am here to, to facilitate and help you create the best story you can create also. Question in the back. Isn't that awesome? It's a Flickr. If you go to Flickr and you, and you search Lego Star Wars, <laughs> you'll find it. I always have a Lego Star Wars in every one of my presentations. <laughs> um, Can we go back to your email? My email? Sure. And you'll get it. You, I mean, I'm sure Tracy will send it all out. Um, does, I can take like one or two questions. Are there any? Yes. Um, how important is it to be fresh each year? Valley Gifts has been operating now for at least three years. Yeah. Would good things that you used two years ago be appropriate to keep, or should you have something fresh every year? I would go with fresh. Fresh over frozen. That's my motto here. <laughs> Next question. What do, you, what do you think is a reasonable uh, volume of stuff? How many posts? How many? All right, question about reasonable volume, and, and this will be our last question because I know people have to go. Reasonable volume of how many posts, how much to share, you know, it depends on the channel. You can post a lot more on, you can share all the time on Twitter. You shouldn't share all the time on Facebook, you know. It, it really depends on the channel, to be honest with you. And you have to see what your audience tolerates. But I would say definitely, like, with re most social media channels, once a day for sure. And then many more times after that. You don't, except for blogging, I wouldn't blog more than, like, three or four times a week at the most. All right. I'm available to answer questions afterwards. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>